Hello, this is Dan Farisi, Editor-in-Chief with Commercial Integrator. Thank you so much for joining us for this informative webcast here today. The title, of course, is Future-Proofing Control Room Operations in the Face of a Changing Environment. I know many of you were at Infocom 2023 earlier this summer, and it seemed like command and control spaces, control rooms, were getting an incredible amount of attention. Naturally, therefore, Commercial Integrator and I wanted to make sure that we covered this important category as well as how it's changing and how to optimize operations in those control room environments. We're delighted to have two true expert organizations joining us today, uh, you know, kind of co-putting on this webinar. We have Datapath and Winstead, so we thank them so much for bringing this content to you. We're joined by Greg Babs from Datapath, who is Strategic Business Development Manager with EMEA, and Sean Brady from Winstead, who is VP of product development. We'll bring them on in just a moment, but I do want to just share some information about commercial integrator webinars in case you've never been on one before. This webcast, of course, is being broadcast over the internet. Please make sure that your audio levels are acceptable so you can hear all the content. If you're having any problem with the stream, sometimes it's beneficial to disconnect and then reconnect and you might be able to catch a better stream. So that's the, the first point of uh, a potential failure. So feel free to go ahead and rejoin if you're having any issues like that. As far as questions go, we will be ganging them up and kind of dealing with them toward the end of the one hour window that we have, probably about 45 minutes in, we'll turn to questions. So as questions arise, as the conversation goes on, please put them in the question box. They will all be uh, queued up for me to take a look at when we turn to the question and answer period. Please don't wait till the last minute because you may of course forget what you had been thinking about. As the questions arise, please put them in there and I promise we'll get to as many as we possibly can before the end of this one hour webinar. Thank you again for joining us. Now I wanna introduce our presenters. As I mentioned, Sean Brady from Winstead who is VP of product development and Greg Babs from Datapath, who is Strategic Business Development Manager, EMEA. Sean, Greg, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sure it's gonna be a fascinating conversation. Thanks entirely to your insights and wisdom on this category. Thanks for having us, Dan. Thanks for having us. So let's get right into it. And as I say, we wanna draw on Datapath and Winstead's collective wisdom. Um, we've talked a lot about technology evolution. We do that in commercial integrator all the time, elevated performance expectations, data's growing ubiquity. All of this is, is prevalent throughout the commercial AV industry, of course, but it's especially, I think, important in the context of control rooms. So against that backdrop, technology evolution, performance expectations, data's ubiquity, what are some of the most important ways control rooms and command and control environments have changed over the last few years? You know, for me, I, I think of a few key points there, and, and the first one being just the, all the, the, the data that's out there and that disparate data sources, you know, across multiple networks, domains, and even sometimes physical locations uh, has really been on the rise. You know, we've never seen that as much data as we do today that's available and, and just being able to transport that data to, to, the, to, the, to the operator level. Uh, the next one for me is also going to be, you know, all the enhanced security requirements, you know, not only physical security, but especially cybersecurity is always at center stage, especially now. Uh, the new ones that are kind of starting to pop up is, is really the including the inspection of, of the chain of custody of suppliers and, and materials. Uh, and also throughout this webinar, you know, I'm going to I'm going to use the term operator as a generic term in this discussion. Uh, but it's important to know that there are many different types of. Uh, types and roles of functions in the control rooms, you know, uh, like operators, analysts, dispatchers, controllers, watch standards, or watch standards, uh, you know, only to name a few. But again, they all don't do the same thing, but it's important to know that. Uh, but really for me also, I focus a lot on the design side of things. So during the design, uh, it's a lot of the lack of attention to the operator, you know, not understanding that the control room is all about the operator focus, and then not planning the technology uh, along with the physical planning which tends to introduce, you know, some poor ergonomics. Uh, that's another thing that I've kind of seen on the rise here of late. Yeah, I mean, just to to add to that, uh, Sean, I think from from my point of view as well, um, really the past sort of five years, ten years or so, I think the the key thing that we've noticed when we engage with the end customers is really the amount of available data points to an operator, as you say, loosely defined, uh, within the control room has just grown massively. Um, I mean, the obvious ones, 
DCS and process control systems have been around a long time in, in many cases. But if you talk to them, many end users have adopted a digitalization program to move uh, fixed assets and other things into a remote asset monitoring situation or to digitalize their assets to get ahead of the curve and try to move into uh, preventative maintenance planning and things like that. They're also leveraging use of technology from elsewhere, IP cameras, drone footage, IPTV, uh, telemetry applications. So if you think for as an operator, you have your primary uh, function, but you're calling upon all this extra data to help you make that decision or to, to spot certain things. Um, so we've noticed really the applications themselves being the key, the key thing, of course, they're improving a lot and the improve, improving or uh, just say the developments that the application developers are putting in is focusing a lot on AI and automated decision making, intelligent learning. When this happens, we seem to know that this happens. And so, as Sean mentioned, a lot of these subsystems that are in place, they're still isolated. So it means that when you're designing a control room, you, you're taking in all this data and bearing it in mind, but you're faced with the issue of, well, how do I present the data? How do I interact with it in the most intelligent way? And so that leverages a lot of difficulties on the ergonomic, but also human factors sides. And then how is data being consumed inside the control room? Um, and so that data consumption element, we've also seen changing. It's not just data at the operator in a single physical location or a single room. Um, it could be remote operations. Uh, it could be field workers, resilient sites. So there's a lot of changes around, around that that people need to take into account, I think. I feel like you've both set the table for the conversation to follow really, really well, <laughs> talking about some of those high level points. Um, but let's go ahead and, and burrow a little bit deeper into pain points in particular. We're talking about future proofing control room environments. How, do, how are we going to identify some pain points? I know you're both in the trenches in those control room environments mm -hmm. very regularly. Um, mm -hmm. What do you continually see? in the pain point respect, uh, challenges that lim limit operator effectiveness or that jeopardize outcomes. And of course, these control room environments are frequently very mission critical where lives can be at stake or well-being can be at stake. So those pain points really are consequential, aren't they? Yeah, they really are. And, and you know, the there's a lot of pain points as you kind of go through the cycle. And, and I'm gonna touch on just a couple of the, the primary de design points as, as you kind of go through this and, and things to look out for and some of the gotchas that are out there. You know, most control rooms, when uh, when they're set out to, to to be explored, to set the scoping of, of of those when they start the design process, you know, most of them really want to be corporate showpieces, and they should be. I mean, when you think about the the level of investment uh, that a company is putting into a control room, you know, usually it's you know millions of dollars. So, uh, you know, making sure that they look they look nice along the way is important. But you know, sometimes people get a little bit too cute with the overall design. Uh, you know, they go with what looks cool over what's actually functional to the operators. You know, in functional control rooms, you know, they, they don't look like sports stadiums and they don't look like your local sports bar. You know, they, they may have the cool displays, but that's not really the point of the, of the control room. Um, you, you know, and, and when you focus on on too much of that cool factor, you start to tend to, to, to lose sight of, again, the operator. Uh, but this also starts to, to introduce poor ergonomics, bad sight lines, and, and just generally not having the control room set up the way that you want it because you're looking at, at form over function. Um, another one of the pain points is, is like we just touched on a minute ago is information overload. You know, too many monitors, too many data points. You know, too many, too many, too much data that's not really relevant to what the operator is needing to focus on. Um, you know, it, it decreases that focus, and you know, too much information also creates something uh, something called situational blindness. Uh, if you haven't heard of the term, um, give it a Google. You know, it's a it's a really interesting thing that's out there right now. Uh, that, that's drawing more awareness. You know, we all talk about situational awareness, but be aware of situational blindness too. Um, and including features in a design that, that just don't follow functional aesthetics. You know, functional aesthetics is something that I like to, that is a term that I like to use, uh, and that should be avoided. So really anything that's in the control room should really have a function. So if you're adding something that aesthetic, you know, make sure it has some sort of another benefit to the control room. 
um, you know, if you want to have a, a ceiling fixture, you know, make sure that it's got some acoustical properties or something like that in it. You know, another example is, um, you know, you might have a, a, a really nice LED ring lighting fixture, you know, in the ceiling that looks super cool. Um, but, but really is that ring lighting the most effective thing for the operation, you know, whereas maybe introducing something functional like a circadian lighting system, you know, might be a better operational choice in the 24 seven environment. Uh, you know, all of these things, when you, when you start to take the operator out of the central focus, um, really introduces some of those distractions and is not improving on the recognition response time, you know, which is really the purpose and criticality of the control room itself. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to, to dovetail that, really, I mean, I think from the uh, sort of pain points, um, when we talk to or engage with the end users, there's two types of pain points, really, that we look at. One is the operational perspective, you know, the, the sort of management figures. Um, they're looking at how they can improve things. Um, and so we've seen some industries in particular um, have suffered by adopting what's called decentralized operational models, meaning that the parts of the business are separated together into independent control rooms. Uh, so we see that a lot in, or have seen it a lot in airports, but we see it as well in, in rail where they've got electrification from electronic signaling points from control. And so they're almost operating in silos like independent businesses. Um, and these decentralized models can often have a detrimental effect on the outcome of the operations um, because the end user is, is constantly firefighting and reacting to situations too far down the line. And the ones that we've seen shift towards a centralized operational model where they put these people in the same room, they've often found that the results go much, much higher. Uh, on, from an outcome perspective, because it means that they can encourage collaboration, that teams can start to interact and share data in, in a much better way, um, and they can learn from the findings. Again, we see that in uh, some, some oil and gas who've removed to remote operations. They've created these onshore collaboration centers, um, and they found by putting the teams together, even though they operate different assets, they can all start to learn from what each other are doing and try to get ahead of the curve. Because I don't think control rooms will ever prevent incidents from occurring. I think the, fo the focus really is about how quickly you can react to an incident. Can you spot it? And if you can spot it, how do you minimize the impact, the downtime, the risk, the cost, et cetera? Um, so that's one of the key pain points when you speak to the management side. On the operator side, um, just as, as Sean rightly said, uh, you have to start from the operator out. And if you don't operate that approach, you're going to get in trouble. Um, so you have to look at the operator as the key chess piece. What applications do they need access to? What's the most efficient way to present and consume that data? How and when do we need to involve different colleagues and departments? Because not every decision requires every department to be involved. And so how does that collaboration look? What's the workflow behind it? So that's what I think really the pain points that we see and discuss on a more frequent basis. Starting with the operator out, I think is such an important way to frame this. If really from the beginning of this conversation, both you, Greg, and you, Sean, have emphasized the centrality of the operator in the context of future-proofing control room operations, that optimized operations really rest on the operator's shoulders and giving them the tools they need to be able to be successful. So for that reason, I want to turn next to operators and how much of control room success does rest on their shoulders. Can you talk a little bit about how considering ergonomics, paying attention to operator well-being, all of that kind of thing, tends to result in markedly improved control room operations and accordingly improved outcomes. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you said it perfectly. You know, if, if you if you try to take the operator out of the operations center, what do you have? You know, you just have a center and what's the purpose of it? You know, so uh, it, it's kind of funny when you think of it that way. But, you, you know, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but, you know, the operator should always be the primary focus. Uh, you know, and, I, and that's just that's that operator out, out mentality, you know, that's, as Greg mentioned a minute ago, um, it, it, because it all starts there. And really when you're even going through those, that starting point of design, 
you know, we like to start with, with something we term as the micro environment. And the micro environment is defined as this is the operator's workspace, the primary operator workspace where they're looking at, um, you know, how many screens are there. You're looking at how many, um, how many, how many keyboards you have on the desk. What else is, what else is required there? Do you have phones? Do you have radios? Do you have uh, touch panel interfaces to control some of your other AV systems or your building systems? You know, all of these things are really important. But then, as you mentioned, with the ergonomic effect of that, you know, there are certain things that can improve the operator's well-being and, 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 and life in the control room. It's, you know, the sit-stand desk, the sit-stand mechanism. So being able to stand up uh, while you're working on those long shifts. These guys are in there for, you know, 12, 14-hour day, days, most shifts. And, you know, sometimes they're there for days on end, you know, depending on the situation. So making sure that you really have that, that operator microenvironment dialed in is, is really important. Um, Again, and, and having the right the right other tools like the the, the adjustable monitor arms. Uh, do you need personal heating and cooling? Having task lighting so that you can read printed data that might be that might presented be presented to you. All those things are are, are greatly important in that micro environment. But then once you kind of figure out what that micro environment should be, you know, then you can start duplicating that. As long as you've got operators that have the same type of, of workflow, you know, you've got the optimal micro environment. Let's start to uh, increase that to however many operators are going to be in the space to create that larger macro environment. And when we talk about the macro environment, when you start to set that up, it's, okay, you've got one operator in, in one location, then you've got another one next to you. Do you need to have some sort of visible communication? Do you need to have some sort of audible communication to that person? And then understanding those different job functions as you place them in the space is important. You know, but then let's look at the technology of the room that, that's also presented. You know, you've got, is there, is there uh, overview displays? Is there a video wall? You know, setting the distance from the micro environments to the video wall is the next thing to make sure that you've got the right visual acuity. You know, you got to make sure that you can see that, uh, that, that, that data that's, that's being placed on the wall. You know, do you have the right sight lines? Do you have enough ceiling height? All those things kind of play into account for it. Then you can start to look at what does the traffic flow of the room look like? You know, do you have the right, um, pathways to, to keep people from cutting in front of the data that the operators need to see. Is the, the kitchen and bathroom and war room facilities, are all these things uh, close enough and in the right path that it doesn't distract the operator if they have to go to another area? You know, those things are, are really important when you, look at, uh, when you look at building out that macro environment, but that's also still how you keep the operator in the focus as you design the rest of the space. You know, operator health and well-being really should be at the top, uh, top priority uh, of the design, you know, with all the ergonomic standards and best practices that are out there. And as you go through each checkpoint, specifically at the micro environment level, those need to be really identified uh, at, at every stage, you know, just to make sure, hey, does, is, does this have the operator's best uh, health and well-being in mind? Yeah, I mean, but my sort of personal experience, I suppose, um, is not as, as deep as, as Sean for uh, control room design ergonomics, uh, just from his background is uh, extensive and, and wide, widely uh, adopted. So uh, I, I learn a lot whenever I uh, speak to Sean, but I think uh, from the consultants who design control rooms I talk to over, over here in Europe and, and end users who are fami more familiar with designing them, um, we often get referenced the ISO 11064 on control room design ergonomics guidelines. And there are some other governing bodies uh, over here in Europe, like NORSOC uh, in Norway or EEUMA for sort of chemical safety and stuff. Um, so they, they really do a good job at sort of informing customers about overall control room design ergonomics. So they don't tell you what <laughs> what specifically you've got to do each step along the way. You've got to take some uh, some sort of guidelines and, and take that to, to yourselves. But I do think that uh, design ergonomics really are a crucial part of where you have to be with control room. Um, on the data path side, the ergonomics we really see is, is really about looking how to blend um, technology and IT equipment into the workspace as an enabler of an outcome, the outcome being quicker, faster, better decisions, reduce fatigue, all those kind of things, um, in order to enhance the operator performance rather than them thinking, oh no, this technology is a distraction. You know, we, we've talked to people before who said, oh, we introduced KVM where um, people had 
multiple things on a screen and then it switched to to one thing and we had a lot of phone calls saying hey yesterday i i had four things on my screen now i've only got one so really it's about the simplicity of technology to enable those things rather than them being a hindrance let's say to to what you're trying to do so uh, yeah design ergonomics are key to to successful operations i think I want to stick with this topic of enhancing operator performance, but I just want to quickly remind everyone in our audience, if any questions are percolating in your mind as a result of this conversation, please drop them in the question box. I already see a few great questions queued up in there, but please, if anything is, uh, is stimulated in your mind and you're thinking, I'd love to ask about that or learn more about that or dive deeper into that, don't hesitate to ask that question because I know Sean and Greg would love to tackle them as we approach the end of the webinar. Now, though, let's continue with this idea of operator well-being and how important it is to delivering excellent outcomes. But let's pinpoint technologies that might tend to empower and support control room operators. I'm sure technologies are available that can really optimize uh, operator facilitation and operation and, and effectiveness. But what might some of those technologies be? For, for me, Dan, you know, it's really not it's not one thing. Um, there's not one specific thing that the control room needs uh, needs to have in order to be successful. You know, it's really a balance and a harmony of all of the things that are that are inside the control room to kind of work together. Um, you know, all those components that that make it up. You know, whether it, whether it comes to everything that's happening at the desk, uh, the specific tool sets like like Greg mentioned, if there's KVM at the desk and then the video wall processing system. You know, it all has to work together uh, because if if we still look at those. Uh, those systems independently and not as a, as a holistic system, that's when things start to get a little, a little dis, disjointed in the, in, in the operational picture. Um, you know, but, but integrated solutions that, that focus on, on the needs of the operator to kind of help them reduce all the amount of clicks and glances and jumping between those disparate systems, you know, that, that's how you're really going to affect the operator and being able to improve his, his overall workflow of the day. Um, and, and looking at and evaluating, you know, those workflows is key to, to these improvements. You know, and that's how you make the significant change of the operation. You, you know, of course, having the operator involved in those discussions and buying into those selected changes is always, you know, key for improvements and also some of that change management. Uh, but control room projects are usually very, you know, heavily technology focused and having, you know, both operations and IT involved in those concept stages, you know, through the development and the integration and, and, and the planning is important. Uh, you know, when we look at when we look at some of these these technology packages that are out there, we talked a little bit about AB over IP, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we go. Um, but that's becoming a, a, a bigger a bigger subject, you know, in the technology you know portion of the control room. But having IT involved in those projects early on is really important um, because you know even even at some points of these, you know, these used to be big facilities projects, and they're not necessarily big facilities projects anymore. They're almost more IT projects than anything else. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say Datapath Atria on my Dan. I mean, I, <laughs> if I can plug technologies, but I, I, mean, I, I would like to think they, <laughs> I'd say it was a pretty good technology for uh, for that. But no, joking aside, I think I think Sean hit the nail on the head, really. I don't want to, to overemphasize it. Um, you'll never get away from the fact that there are more than one system you've got to use. Uh, I think that's unavoidable you know whether it's from process control to to bms hvac fire security avit but the best control room designs are the ones that focus on integration and sometimes that that can be a confusing word when i talk to end users when, when they talk about integration because sometimes they get the impression what you're trying to present is a single unified software application that now sits on top of everything and does the job of pulling everything in together. Um, I, I don't think that's really what we mean by integration, but it's more about s sort of streamlining workflows, right? So that you can have a maximum output. It's about how does the AV and the IT fit in with the process control application and everything else. So uh, for me, that's that's the primary driver, as, as Sean said. Um, So let's talk about data in the context of control rooms. Obviously, control rooms can be 
hospital or medical control facilities. There can be transportation control facilities. There can be government or defense or military control facilities. We're talking about vast landscapes of data in almost every case. All that information, therefore, you know, is going to empower decision makers to collaborate effectively, respond quickly, at least ideally that's what it would be doing. Can you talk a little bit about the role of AV over IP, which you mentioned, those kinds of networks, and how they can be critical in navigating this, this panoply of data we're dealing with? Yeah, and you know, the, 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 we, when we talked, it's kind of a common theme here is, you know, we've talked about, you know, all these different weird data points that are out there. And, and you know, they can, like we said earlier, it can be uh, on a different network, it can be on a different domain, it can be at a different location, you know, and, and how do we bring all that stuff together? Uh, and ideally, it's just over the network because that's that's what's connecting all of our facilities. You know, so when you're talking about connecting the facilities, you know, whether it's you know over a over uh, over a specific VPN tunnel, if you're trying to go site to site, or if it's you know just trying to to manage between a SCADA system or a SCADA network and a and a regular corporate corporate network. I mean, how do you get that data to go from one network to the other and ultimately to pay potentially an AV network? You know, without compromising any of the security. You know that that's important, and, and we and as control and professionals, we kind of know the right ways to do those things. But you know, early, I, I guess one of the things that I could say is, you know, early in your design, engage with your clients' IT groups. You know, start to get familiar with their IT policies. Uh, leverage those those IT resources in the decision making process. You know, I I remember a couple of years ago, I was involved in a project where, you know, we had been going down a certain road. Uh, and operations really liked this system and they really wanted to deploy this system. And it, it came back and, and when they were getting ready to cut the PO, IT said, whoa, what are you doing? That, that, you can't do that. And then we kind of had to start all over again. You know, and, and you don't want to have to go back and repeat three, four months of a project cycle just because you hadn't had the right people involved early enough. And Greg, I'm sure you hear, hear this you know, quite frequently too. Um, you know, if you don't have the right people involved in the conversation, it never stops with the control room manager. It never stops with the procurement agent. You know, there's lots of people that make these decisions. Um, but, you know, as you leverage those uh, those resources uh, in some of these projects, you know, also allow them to, to conduct in-house security testing, you know, to ensure that the devices are not only, you know, compliant to what you're saying in your in your documentation, but it's also compliant to their security policies. Their security policies can be very different. Uh, than the security policies that that the manufacturer sets. Um, you know, another thing that that always seems to trip people up in the end is, you know, as you go through your documentation phase of your of your project and you're starting to put together, okay, this is this is how the AV system, you know, is functionally connected. But how does that data get into the AV system? How does that AV system affect the regular network topology that that's that's already established uh, in in the corporation and in the company? You know, clearly identifying and mapping out uh, how the, any data traverses the networks is handled. Uh, and when dealing with, with that data, whether it's secure, isolated networks, you know, also that there's, that there's no security compromises there. There's no uh, back channel data streams, you know, that are, uh, that are out there, like, uh, like the Ethernet channel that's available through HDMI. You know, some people don't think about that. Um, or, or that there's, you know, if you're doing some sort of a advanced PDM system, that there's no, you know, backhaul USB somewhere that, that's connected that could potentially have an intrusion availability. Having the IT groups kind of invested in that and going through that design process with them, letting them ask all of their questions makes it easy, not only from an education standpoint, uh, from a manufacturer level, uh, but also getting those teams to buy in because ultimately they're the ones that are going to have to support it after the AV teams leave. Um, so, so kind of getting them, getting them involved in that. And I like to say, you know, don't just educate on the technology, but you have to educate on the data transmission as well. Yeah, I mean, from, from my standpoint, I was, I was chuckling away at some of the things you were saying because it, it is true. I mean, I had a meeting with uh, an airport a few months back and we had the operations team into the showroom and they deliberately said, you know, we, we didn't invite IT to this meeting because they'll start asking a load of technical questions and bore us to death. Um, but operations, yes, they're the users, but IT play a key a key role because especially when you start thinking about OT and IT applications, they absolutely need to be sure that certain things are kept isolated from each other. So I don't think that 
one can have their say without the other. I think you have to harmonise uh, different people's opinions and uh, and ideas. But going back just to AV over IP, I think it makes sense. I think everyone in, in the AV industry has probably been convinced and we're probably preaching to the choir. But from a control room perspective, the AV over IP introduction and even KVM over IP, the key factors really are the scalability um, and the capability to make things available, right? And I think that goes back down to data consumption, it, down to, yeah, okay, the operator's the one with the keyboard and the mouse, not even their supervisor needs to control it. But there's a heck of a lot of people that want to see it, right? Uh, and so the supervisor want to copy, you might send them to video walls, to auxiliary displays, to incident management rooms. And obviously these crisis rooms don't want to be a control room, um, but they may have KPI and da dashboard information, but they may want some of the situational awareness that's in it. Um, and so I think that's where AV over IP just makes sense because you get the scalability and the capability to just pass data more easily than you can on a closed AV infrastructure. You know, another interesting thing about that too, Greg, when you talk, when you start thinking about, you know, all the different pieces that that break that make up the uh, the AV over IP system is, you know, where do those live? You know, a lot of times the traditional control room has always been, oh, we're going to have a PC that lives in the bottom of my console and it's going to cable up to the console <laughs> and connect the monitor. You know, but then there was this new methodology of oh let's gonna let's just go ahead and back rack all that stuff you know let's get it let's get it back in the it room let's get it out of our hands and let the it group manage it uh but then they were like well i don't have room for that stuff why do i why do i want to put it back there and then then you, you've kind of got this new this new conversation starting of you know well where does where do all these devices live and you know what network do they live on who manages that network and and you know how does this stuff get patched you know and and kind of putting together you know almost like that uh almost like that plan of, you know, not only after the system is installed, but then how do we keep it updated, you know, as it goes through, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, as it goes through, you know, down the line. Uh, I think that's kind of one of the new interesting questions. And, you know, even with console systems, you know, now you can buy console systems that don't even have computer storage underneath of them. Um, you know, it can save you a lot of money in the end, but, you know, where, where do you put your physical devices? Uh, how do you then mm -hmm. get that signal from that, that data room or, or wherever the devices live back to the, back to the displays. And uh, I think that's one of the other interesting things where IV, AV over IP kind of plays a, a fun role in that uh, because it can do a whole lot more than what it used to be just, you know, content management. Now it's a whole lot more than that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Just one more quick reminder for our audience. If you do have questions uh, resulting from this conversation, please do put them in the question tab. As I mentioned, there are a few already in there, but if there's anything that you would love to see Greg and Sean address, don't hesitate to put it in there and we'll get to as many as possible as the webinar begins to wrap up. But now let's just talk about integrators for a moment. You know, commercial integrator, as per the name, that is who we target our content to. That is who we have in mind. Control rooms, as we've talked about, are absolutely mission critical. They must be designed to be maximally effective with minimal downtime. So how can integrators who work in this market ensure that their designs and their deployments meet that standard, which is a very high standard, while also being, as per the title of this presentation, future-proof for ongoing evolution? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question and a half, Dan. <laughs> I mean, can it really be future-proof? Um, it's, it, we can set up some best practices, but, you know, future proof is a, is a, is a tough one to live by. Um, I, I kind of take a lot of this stuff again, back to my design roots, you know, but the best advice is, you know, when you're scoping a project, uh, you know, establish what the life cycle is going to be of your control room. You know, if you know, in the scheme of things, okay. Um, the initial deployment is going to be based on a five, uh, a five year or a 10 year technology refresh, you know, knowing that. Uh, is the is the physical footprint planned for a 20 to 25 year lifespan? Are you just moving your operation into a smaller space so you can build a new facility? Uh, you know, a lot of those things can kind of help develop whether or not or how far you need to go to, to future proof something. Uh, and, you know, the other thing that I think about, too, is, you know, think of the changes in the last five years. I mean, not just with technology. Technology's changed a lot in the last five years. 
um, but just even in the way of in the way of our lives, you know, thinking about what we learned from the pan, from the pandemic, you know, establishing those understandings is really important. You know, from what has happened in technology in the last five years, what's the proposed life cycle of the technology, and then what's the proposed life cycle of the space can kind of lead you down that road. If you like, so today, let's just keep on the networking conversation. So today, you know, your system might only need a, a one gig network to, to operate. You know, but the next system you're looking at, that the one that you're deploying in the next couple of years that, or that you're designing now, maybe that's based on a, a 10 gig system. You know, so making sure that you've got those upgrade paths kind of set up is important. But then let's talk about five to 10 years. You know, five to 10 years, um, you know, a, a terabyte system is not is not out of the question. You know, it's it's completely reasonable. And really, that's kind of where IEEE is starting to to aiming for some of their standardization is, you know, corporate networks are going to be are going to be, you know, a terabyte a second. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the first thing that you can look at is, you know, setting up that infrastructure backend, you know, for, for what you can do today, but then how you, how can you scale it, you know, is the, is the next thing. Um, so when you look at networking, that that's one thing. Uh, but then when you look at, as you're, as you're deploying your systems and as you're de de designing your systems is, you know, everybody needs redundancy in a control room, but not everything needs to be redundant. You know, I like to say redundancy without over redundancy, you know, cause it's easy to go in and say, Oh, this is a control room. It's a mission critical space. Everything needs to be N plus plus. Okay. Well, that's maybe not quite right. You know, maybe certain things need to be N plus one, maybe some things need to be N plus N, but in the end, it, it, it might not be everything because that's really expensive. When you think about setting up a completely standalone, you know, failover system, you know, you've doubled your technology costs. You know, that, that, that doesn't always, you know, that doesn't always hit the right price point for the control room. Um, but then I also think about redundancy with power. You know, with, when you think of power, um, you know, power is not cheap. Power costs a lot of money. And when you think of, uh, of, you know, building out the power plans for everything, I think that there should still be the, the consideration of A circuits and B circuits so that you've got, you know, two different power feeds in the, in the control room in case you lose one feed or you have another backup that's important. Um, but then really, how far does that redundancy go? You know, if you think about trying to make everything redundant and then you've got dual feeds that are redundant, you know, that, that just gets the snowball out of control and leads to a lot of additional cost. Um, but I will say that it costs substantially more money to add that power after the control room's in place if you didn't already plan for, you know, do I have space in my sub panels? You know, did I not plan for, for dual power feeds? And now I think I should implement that. You know, do we have additional circuits available, you know, that are just kind of, um, you know, ready to go circuits, you know, underneath the floor or something like that? Um, you know, because if you if, say you don't have a raised floor system and you need to pull, you know, you do a refresh and now all of a sudden I need to have additional power. Um, how do I get it there? You know, I, oh my goodness, I don't have I don't have an extra circuit in my panel. I need to add another panel to add another circuit to pull through a system that I've never that I've never planned for that. I mean, that, that's that's kind of tough. Um, so so that's kind of that's the next thing that I think about. Um, you know, it's the same with your cable routing. You know, data cabling is the same way. You know, right now you might have a three inch conduit that you're managing a lot of Cat six cables in. You know, but in five years maybe you're not managing everything over Cat six. Maybe it's Cat eight. Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe you're starting to replace that that cat signal with fiber. You know, do you have additional pools that are already in there ready to go for for future data expansion? I think that's important. Um, when you think about uh, when you think about technology, and you think about uh, you know where technology has come in the in, in the last you know ten years, uh, I like to go back to kind of some of my roots in displays too. Um, you know, with with uh, rear projection cubes. You know, rear projection cubes, in my opinion, are still the best control room, you know, visualization technology out there. I don't need to, to debate that right here, right now. But when you think about <laughs> when you think about the customers that have deployed uh, rear projection cubes, and then you start to think about where they where they want to go in the future with the new technologies of direct view LED and eventually micro LED and some of these other things. You know, the idea behind the efficiency that the, the, the rear projection cubes had to where the current di uh, direct view LED is, the power requirements are vastly different. You know, you almost need double the amount of power to go from that technology to this technology. And I'm not saying that it's not a valuable reason to jump because there is value to, to jump there, but you, but you have to have that kind of plan. 
Because if you're not really doing anything else to your control room today, having that requirement of pulling double the amount of power in is probably a pretty big, pretty big job, you know, just to upgrade your display walls. Uh, the same goes for, for consoles. If you if you're starting to add more positions in the room, and if you and again, if you're raised flooring, if you're not set up with raised flooring and you need to auto, and you need to, to, to grow because you've added another area of responsibility, having those three more consoles, four more consoles installed, you know, that's another significant power requirement that that you need to kind of plan for to have some additional space in the room. Uh, sorry, I kind of went on a little bit long there and probably took some of Greg's time, but <laughs> but those are those are things that, that you got to talk about. You got to start thinking about because you know when you talk about future proofing, it can go a lot of different ways. You get equal time, Greg. No worries. <laughs> don't, don't worry, I don't need as much. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I, I chuckled as you uh, mentioned a few of those things because obviously, when you start with, if somebody says downtime, I think most people automatically assume. Um, <laughs> mitigating failure to the point of redundancy, right? So I, I would often say to our engineers, you know, it's product engineers and R&D guys, oh, yeah, you know, the customer's interested in, in redundancy. And they would just go, what do you mean by redundancy? And as you start to go into it, yeah, but that could fail. Oh, yeah, so well, let's put more in. Also, we would put more in and more in. So redundancy ends up being this never-ending cycle of, more plus more plus more. So that's why I was chuckling at what you were saying, uh, Sean. But usually the sort of definition of redundancy falls usually somewhere between uh, risk that the customer's willing to accept versus the budget they've got available, right? Uh, so I think that minimizing the downtime, of course, you have to think about redundancy as one of the key things. But another thing, if I could just mention really about fair, sort of downtime is it's trying to select carefully the equipment and the technology that you use for being for mission critical purposes. So, yes, there are certain things out there. I don't know, a, a video wall controller or a matrix switch for a video wall. But you can start to then separate things from from one to another, because is it designed for that primary purpose of mission critical 24 seven use? Right. So I think there are certain things that customers can do just on the selection of the equipment to help minimize the downtime. Um, but then downtime for me is also the subtle things like um, planning for maintenance, planning for service accessibility, driver updates and so on and things like that, you know, because control rooms can't just be switched off because I fancy them being switched off because I need to do this thing, right? They have to schedule that a long time in advance. You can't just pick up and move an entire control room to a spare building <laughs> that we've got mm -hmm. just down here so you can do that, right? The show must go on. Um, and so I think a good control room design plans for that also. It's not just planning for the uptime, but planning for the accessibility of the service and the maintenance and things like that. And so I, th I think there are things people can do in addition to the obvious redundancy to help out with the downtimes. Um, when it comes to future proofing, I, I think it's very difficult for them to future proof, right? Because technology evolves, like Sean said, too quickly, right? And if you look at a control room life cycle, it's seven, 10 years or more, right? And they often purchase through obsolescence planning, you know, so they don't just change control room video walls because the next new kid on the block came out and we saw it at Infocom, right? So they tend to sort of plan these things in, in stages. And if you take that further into account, that if that's in operation, I may have written the design specs one to three years before that room was even operational, right? And so a lot can change over seven, 10, 12, 15 years. So I think it is very difficult for somebody to future proof what technology is out there because you're trying to second guess what might be available. And I think that's difficult. So I think from a future proofing point of view, the things really that you need to think about, the things that Sean was more touching upon, it's you have to future proof for expansion and change, right? And even the ISO standards as I mentioned before for control rooms, it touches upon planning for growth, right? And that's where I think people benefit more from future proofing. Have they got a scalability in their design? They're not just asking the question of 
how many operators do you have right now? How many applications? Well, how many screens do you want on the wall, right? They've got to plan for scalability. So I think th those would be the, the ways that we've seen and guide people in their designs rather than kind of here's our roadmap for the next three years, take into account that this 10 gig is going to be superseded by something in 10 years time, right? I think it's too difficult for people to, to do that. That's a very yeah. good point. Um, I, I commend both of you for throughout this whole conversation, really focusing purely on thought leadership and education. But I do want to give you both an opportunity to talk at least a little bit about <laughs> the, the synergy and the power that's unlocked when industry leaders like Datapath, like Winstead, bring together their core competencies to help overcome control room challenges, effectuate better outcomes. Do you want to talk a little bit about how your organizations synergize to elevate and improve these spaces? You know, the, for me, it's it's the, the buzzword of integrated solutions really starts to become a real thing. You know, when you work with, with teams of people that understand control rooms, uh, their technology, their operational needs, and the criticality, uh, it really allows them to make those systems kind of dis you know, design those systems to really work in harmony. Um, you know, I like to, I like to tell the story of, you know, with Winstead that, you know, what, what our focus is, is we're creating the intersection of the operator and technology. And, you know, that's the purpose of the console, you know, having that vision from the design side uh, to the integration side, to ultimately the service side of the system. That's, that's key to make sure that, that all these systems kind of start to work in harmony because you got to have a place to, to store all this stuff. Um, but really, that, that, that console serves a purpose, you know, at, at that stage. But if I go into a control room five years down the road and someone's talking about the console or they're focusing on the console, I think I might have done something wrong because really the, the, the console is just the interface between the operator and the technology. And that's really where we want to focus. So, you know, at the onset, it, the console has a job. There needs to be a point so that you can service your technology and kind of really bring that home. Um, but ultimately, it's all about connecting the operator to the technology. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree here, here. <laughs> um, I think, uh, it, I mean, going back to everything we've been saying uh, in this discussion, really, is that if you're planning for the operator being the key component, the idea of just deciding things in silo, in isolation, is, is going to af negatively affect the outcome. So I think the end users benefit really from technology partnerships and technology partnership isn't just going, hey, we both sell products into control rooms. Why don't we buddy up? Um, I think it's more about people who understand how this blends with this and some of the things that you've got to think about that roll into what we're doing as well. Um, so I think as as uh, Sean mentioned, you know, a console and uh, let's say KVM over IP, you might think, well, how can that be integrated as such? But it's more about the thought process behind the user and what is the best way from an ergonomic standpoint of how do you present this whole environment to somebody? Um, what happens when you and you are both included in the same project? What does that mean for the user? Uh, and so I think bringing those blended manufacturers together can really help harmonize the end result for whoever's going to use it or whatever they're trying to achieve, uh, which is not always the same from one one user to the next, even though they have a control room. Uh, so that's yeah, my two cents. <laughs> well, well, this has been a, a fascinating conversation, I have to say, really, really informative. I do want to make sure we set aside some time to get to the questions. We have some really thoughtful questions, so it's time to, to sharpen the pencil and dig in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, though, for this presentation, Sean and Greg. We'll now move into the questions. The first one is, you mentioned control rooms may never be able fully to, present, to prevent incidents. How could predictive AI potentially change that? Any thoughts about that? Do you, do you want me to go, Sean? Because I think I was the one that raised it, and then you can uh, butt in and tell me uh, if you disagree or agree. <laughs> uh, but really, you know, when, when I speak to to end users, this is less from an AV standpoint, but more from the control rooms, right? They say uh, we can get into asset monitoring, right? We can take a fixed asset, call it a pipeline, and we can try to predict through technology 
patterns of when something might go wrong. We can see when an asset is offline or no longer functioning. And we can try to take what we're doing less from a reactive standpoint of, oh, something's just flagged, we've got something to do. It's all down to who deals with the alarm and how quickly they can do it. It's more, ah, we've noticed a pattern there. So can we get ahead of the curve to try to delay an incident? Or maybe when an incident is there, detect how that may then knock on to something else, onto something else. So I think where AI and automated processes, it's really just taking into account intelligence from how you're dealing with things in real time and trying to get the user ahead of the curve. So I don't think there will ever be a situation where you can 100% become incident prevention. You are trying to deal with things quickly, but you can sort of take your learnings to accelerate the decision making or to accelerate, minimize the impact of certain things happening. And that tends to be when I'm speaking to people, how they're using the applications to do that. Yeah, I kind of see sure. it very similarly. <laughs> you, you know, I, I'll, I'll use two different examples. So for instance, like the way I see AI kind of being effectual in, you know, predictive type things, like for an electric utility, let's say, based on a weather report that you get, that you know that there is an increased heat wave coming, you know that that's going to directly impact the amount of load on your system. So you know that depending on the system that it is, you know, are you going to need to bring more assets online? Are you going to need to, uh, you know, shuffle that load? And how do you shuffle that load? So I think AI can can have a big a big benefit and improvement on on that. But the way that it presents in the control room, I think, is different. So in in the control room, I think that it's more about AI can cause other things to happen based on on other conditions. So you could see a condition of something there's a failure in a line and that's going to impact this substation and the rest of this area um, but then automatically queuing up certain visuals and certain data that allows the operator to more quickly respond to that to that incident i think is another way that i see ai being used it, it, two, two, two very different things one at the control level and then one at or at the at the prevention level and then one at the uh the impact of control uh the other one that i would kind of reference would be more of security so we have all of these recognition type cameras out there these days. So if, a, a, if something recognizes a threat automatically through the camera system or through the, through the threat deterrence system, you know, can AI trigger something else? Could it trigger a gate closure or could it trigger another alarm that would, that would, that would start an evacuation and start to at the same time, you know, start to, to, to close the threat off? You know, I think those are some different predictive uh, uses of AI that, that could help things, but it's never it's never going to, like you said, it's never going to get to a, uh, it's never going to take us out of a, a out of a reactive to a proactive type standpoint. So this next question uh, relates somewhat to what we've seen in terms of a trend of more dispersed or diffuse mm -hmm. operators, more dispersed operations or command and control centers. The question is this, what are your thoughts on remote operators and virtual command centers. Do you have any thoughts on those? Do you want me to sure, take you on first? <laughs> sure, if you yeah, want so to. I, yeah. yeah. So, so the you know that's something that we talked about. You know, during the pandemic was was remote operations. Can can someone effectively remotely operate from from home? Um, you know, but there's challenges that go along with that. Um, so so there's that part of it. You know, as far as you've got secure systems, you've got secure networks, how do you get access to those secure networks, you know, through a standard internet connection uh, or, you know, through a, a even a protected VPN tunnel? You know, there's still risks and challenges of that that, that we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, now, virtual command centers, I got, uh, that's another kind of touchy, you know, fringe subject too. But um, when you talk about, uh, satellite centers reporting into primary centers. I think that's one that's that's more realistic for, for today. Um, and and that that's something that happens you know all over. But really the virtual command center idea that you've got multiple multiple remote operators that are kind of working together um, you know in different locations I think is is an interesting plan but there's a lot of security concerns that we have to get through first. Uh, do I think we're gonna get there? Absolutely I think we're gonna get there. 
Um, and I think that may start the, the decentralization of the control room. Uh, we know that there's challenges presented with that. Greg mentioned a few of those early on. Um, but I think we're, we're, we can get there, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, when I hear about remote operations or remote workers, it, it can depend with the definition. Um, so if we look at oil and gas and offshore wind, for example, they're already quite a few years down the line of remote operations, right? They are taking offshore assets and managing them onshore remotely. Um, I think that's a different proposition from I used to work inside the control room and I fancy working from home. Um, I think that is different. And I think that application developers have given people a looking glass to an application. So you might have your thick client inside the control room with the K and the M. The remote workers tend to get the V, right? So I want to see what's going on, but I don't necessarily have the ability to control what's going on. So that's where I can see the remote working. Um, and again, we see that with um, can, can the control room pass any data to the maintenance team in the field or can the maintenance team in the field pass data back to us? And so we are seeing that. Um, virtual control centers, we've not come across a, a, a ton really yet. Um, it's still quite new. One thing that we are seeing, which may be a similar thing, is digital twinning. Um, but that's that's more about um, asset planning right? <laughs> and optimization. So we'll simulate events and see where assets would break down and see where the gaps are before we're dealing with them real time in the control room going, oh, no, we're not prepared for this. Right. <laughs> so from an operational readiness and an operational pre a preparation point of view, uh, digital twinning can help on that simulation model side. But the virtual command center, as you say, uh, Sean, it's uh, in its infancy, I, I would say. But you can never stop these ideas from, from gathering pace. So we, we must be prepared for, for those things. Well, thank you for engaging so robustly, Sean and Greg, with those questions, really thoughtful answers. I want to thank once again, Sean Brady, VP of Product Development with Winstead, as well as Greg Babs, who is Strategic Business Development Manager, EMEA with Datapath, for joining us today. Really, really appreciate your expertise and illuminating this really important subject for all of us. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Future Proofing Control Room Operations in the Face of a Changing Environment, presented jointly by Datapath and Winstead. Really appreciate, as always, your investment in spending time with Commercial Integrator and our thought leadership offerings, both in print, digitally, webinars, etc. We hope you found this conversation informative and enlightening. I do want to let you know that it will be available on commercialintegrator.com in the very near future if you'd like to watch it again or pass it along to a friend or a coworker who you think would benefit from this information. So please do reach out to me if you have any feedback, comments, constructive criticism, ways we can make this programming more effective for you. Reach out to me at dan.farisi at emeraldx.com. Again, dan.farisi at emeraldx.com. Otherwise, just check back on commercialintegrator.com each and every day for more thought leadership and informative content just like this. Have a great rest of the day. Enjoy your summer, and we'll catch you.